service to Brother Branham, God's servant and prophet this morning, for his message with the Lord has given to him, and may God bless him this morning as he comes. Thank you, Brother Neville. The Lord bless you. Thank you. Good morning, friends. It's a privilege to be back in the tabernacle again this morning, feeling fresh and good. The day before yesterday, I couldn't even speak. I had this little bug that's going around, you know, gets in their throats and make them hoarse, but... The Lord helped me and delivered me out of that condition so I could speak this morning to you. And we are glad that there's a nice tabernacle packed full and people standing. I just wish we had some seats and um, to give to those people who are standing. We'd be happy if we had them, but I think everything's taken up. I know you wouldn't want to come sit with these children on the altar and turn your back this other way. <laughs> now, it's been for... A uh, few days that I've been studying on history, and I thought maybe this morning, instead of preaching, I could just teach a while on the Word of God. Amen. And now we'll probably be a little bit late, so I'll, some of you would swap with those who are standing up or something. It would sure be fine if you could if you could do it, and um, give them a little rest. And now. Many of the friends of my friends come, some of them from a long ways off, way down in Georgia, up in Ohio, Tennessee, just different places, Illinois, Missouri, Michigan. They come down from Chicago from just a one a little tabernacle meeting like this. It makes me so grateful for people like that. And not only that, but I'd like to say this, not in the interest of, but in the interest of the Word of God. For nearly every one of those people don't only come, but they bring their tithings along with them to put it in to the church for the help. Ah, uh, that's just, friends, it's loyal. You just can't forget people like that. And then sometimes maybe I have to say something that tears them to pieces. But you see what it means then in your heart. You don't want to do it, but yet there's something that says you must be done. See, So you must do it. And... To see them coming from everywhere and and trying to serve the Lord and believing in the ministry that the Lord has given me and trusting me to be his servant that I would not tell them anything wrong. Then with deadness of sincerity, I must really do all that I know how to to shepherd the souls of those people, knowing that they're not coming here just to be seen, driving across icy mountains and hills and down through uh, uh, jam-packed roads and their children missing food and sleep and their suitcase laying in the back of the car. and You know, that's hard. But the Bible said of such people over in the book of Hebrews, the 11th chapter, even the world is not worthy of such people. I, I say that because I mean it in my heart. And many are here, New Albany, Louisville, and around close, down in Kentucky, and different places not so far away. But yet they're loyal to come, drive through ice, snow, anything else to get here. Now, next Sunday is Christmas Eve. And I thought I was at a Christmas message for the church, but I, I have such a feeling for them little fellows. <laughs> I'm going to say if, they, if I'd be here, then the little fellows would probably, many of them far away, would miss their Christmas and things. So it would be kind of hard on those little fellows. But before going... Now, we, I know that we people here do not teach our children of such a myth as Santa Claus. We do not believe in telling anybody a lie. So you're not going to lie to your children. Such stuff as that. That's mythology to its heights. 
of such a thing that's taken the place of Christ at Christmas. And Christmas is lost. Christmas is no more a worship. It's a celebration. Drinking, gambling, carousing, just pegging to the limit. And it's not... And I wanted to... Maybe after Christmas, I'll speak again on Christmas, you see, so that it won't deprive the little... But you can't tell that to little children like that. They see little fellows on Christmas night getting Christmas presents and things like that. They don't understand it. See, they just... They're too little. And we've got to remember them that they are... Uh, if they have things in common, we've got to bring ourselves down to remember them little fellows. That they themselves... Uh, am I too, too loud on it, brother? Too much volume on it? How about way back in the back? Can you hear me all right back there? Way back? Is it all uh, be let down a little? Wait, I'm standing too close. Which mic is alive? Are both of them? Both of these. This one? And this? Yeah. I, Maybe it's this I think it's that one there. It's good. That's, that's. Now, how's that? Is that better? I find good. Now, the little fellows has to understand, you know, they're, they're little fellows, and we have to remember we were little fellows once, too. Now, I remember when we was little kids, they would get out, cut out an old cedar bush somewhere, mom would pop some corn, string it around it. That's about all there was on the tree. But them little old ragged socks was hung up there just as long. And maybe she get a... Maybe one little sack of candy and them little hard candy and two or three to me and two or three to Humpy and two or three to this. Just little pieces of candy. And we'd keep that all day long, sucking on that, you know, and wrapped up a little piece of paper and put it in our pocket. And if we got an old cap pistol or, or a little horn to blow, it was a great thing. It thrilled us. Today, of course, it's different. The poor people has got a hold of a little bit of money and it's got so they can buy their children more things. They dress better, eat better, live better. And all all the way around, uh, I guess they're better off and under the wage condition of today. And therefore, little kids, you have to let them have something. But always be sure of this. Tell them there is no such a thing as Santa Claus. Because it's not right. One of these days, they'll walk up and say, what about Jesus then? Mm -hmm. So tell them the truth. Be honest with everybody. Be truthful. And especially, you wouldn't tell your children something wrong. Because they'd raise up and say... They believe in you as a Christian, and they want you to. They believe that what you tell them is the truth. So, be sure you tell them the truth. <laughs> then it'll come out all right. Uh, now, and then, um, I want to at least have one more night, if I can, or day, to the tabernacle before I leave on my coming years of service, a uh, year of service, rather. And if it be the will of God, I'll try to. Get much overseas meetings this year, for I feel the need of it, especially in Switzerland, and Sweden, and Norway, and many of the Scandinavian, the Scandinavian countries, and down into Asia. I feel that we are desperately uh, ought to be in prayer over these things. Amen. That we must learn the way of the Holy Spirit, Amen. and the way that He would lead us. And the things that we would uh, ought to do in studying in the early history of the church, uh, Broadbents and Hazeltons and many of their comments on it, Nicene Fathers, and yesterday I just wound up with the complete life of St. Martin that the Catholic Church refused to canonize. God did that. So they, um, of his great life. And how that the same signs and wonders followed that man right down through his life. How he raised two dead people, cast out evil spirits, spoke in unknown tongues, and seen visions and things. And what a great man. But yet in the very secret of his power was in humility before God. And we find today that the church yet teaching its power and teaching the signs to follow the believer, yet we find them puffed out, big, me, little you. And, uh, it, it isn't like the early church, you see. Oh, they were humble and kind to one another and oh, sweet, understanding. And uh, it's so much different today. And I wonder if a lot of this hasn't sidetracked us Amen. from the, the real kernel of 
of the message Amen. that we want to humble ourselves. Keep yourself more humbler you can be, better God will use you. Oh, Studying on mythology and all these myths. Christmas itself is a myth. It's not oh, nothing real about Christmas. Christmas wasn't even mentioned in the Bible. They never worshipped a birthday of Christ. Wasn't no such a thing. That's a Roman Catholic dogma and not a Christian teaching. No scripture for it, nowhere in the Bible, and for the first hundred years after the Bible. Think nothing of it. It's just a myth. Santa Claus, commercial, everything. The whole thing is wound up into a big conglomeration. If you get back and study the beginning of it and look down at it, you'd see where we were at. There is nothing left. Nothing can help but the coming of the Lord. That's all. There's nothing now can help us out of this chaos but the coming of the Lord. Is this that little switch that censors them tapes? <laughs> Maybe I better censor this whole thing. <laughs> it's not <laughs> send it out. <laughs> because it's pretty rude. <laughs> but I say this. So is it, tapes being made now? Don't sell these tapes. See, these tapes are not for sale. They can be passed around through the church or so forth. But because it'll cause confusion as sure as the world. See? So just hold it till we get it fixed different. Amen. Now, before we approach the message and everybody try to be as thinking and as restful as you can. I won't take too long, but I want to take my time so that driving it down so that you'll really see it. Now, let's first, now, if everything's out of the way, I believe, so far, or is there... I, I was just going to say to those three ladies standing over there, they might be able to some sit on the piano seat here. And here's, here's yes, the, let those ladies that are standing yeah, along the side there come up in here. There's a place up here for you, sisters. Don't yeah. you your mother. Here's one right here in front. There's one right here in front. Uh -huh. Here's a chair right back here. There's children up here on the altar. If someone wants to get up and a little child and give their seat to someone, uh, adult standing, while there's room on the on the altar right here for the children and the adult could have the seat. Those ladies standing back behind the pilaster there. If you, it's way back over here in the corner, but it's bit beat standing up there. If you. Would like to stand. Here's, here's some on the platform. Now, some of you brethren that would like to come up here. These children has. Here's one sitting here beside a brother Wade. Come up now. Get your seats right around here so everybody you can be right at home. Feel your, make yourself feel right at home. Brother Shelby, would you like to come? Here's place right here, brother Shelby, up here right here on the platform. If you wish to come up here and sit down by us, right up here. And brother Evans and brother Charlie and you. Here's your seat right here. One right here, two, yeah. two right here. Come right on up, brother. There from, just come right on up. Make yourself comfortably, so we can um, get everybody just as quietly as we possibly can for the for the service, so that you won't be tired and weary and standing up. Some of you, brother and band sisters, way back in the hall there, standing way back down in the hall. You're still a room. Here's another. Here's the piano stool. Someone can use if they'd like to come and sit on it. It would be all right. I see a lady back there motioning an empty seat by the side of she. So then, that's all right. Just make yourself feel just as comfortable as you can. And now, while we're getting situated, let's... Um, uh, it's um, about uh, 20 minutes, 23 minutes after 10 on this 17th day of December. Rainy outside here in Jeffersonville this morning and... And we're um, bad on the outside, but feel good on the inside. Amen. Wonderful. Knowing that we are approaching the coming of the Lord is at hand and approaching eternity. And we're so thankful to God that we are able this morning to stand and to impart to the believer and unbeliever the word of the living God. Trusting that it'll be a great day for all of us to understand the things of the Lord. Now, let us bow our heads just a moment for prayer. And while we have our heads bowed, if there's any would like to be remembered, just raise your hands to God. Remember your request in your heart. Thank you. Our Heavenly Father, as we now are 
in the tabernacle, all seated, and the microphones alive, and the recorders are going, and the Christians are praying, requests being made known, and for some two or three weeks, I've constantly studied on this message for today. Just a few words that maybe the Holy Spirit would use to drive down the subject into the hearts of the people, that they might see the time that we are living and prepare to meet the Lord God. We would pray for all of our sick and afflicted everywhere. O oh, Jesus, remember thy church, universal church, all over the world this morning, some out into the woods, some down in the valley of decision. Some of them are on the mountaintop. And all over the world, thy children are depending on thee and calling on thee. And as John of old from the Isle of Patmos said, even so come, Lord Jesus. And we realize that we're not without the presence of the enemy. He's always near to hinder and to stop and to do anything that he can. But, O oh Lord, give thy children faith this morning. Power to rise above the enemy. To open their hearts and make their soul a field of fertile ground. Where that the word of life may be sowed and bring forth great joy and a wide harvest. I pray, Lord, that you'll bless your word, your servants. Give help to this weak voice of mine that I might be able to hold strong by the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And then in the prayer line, give power and faith, Lord. That there will not be a feeble person in our midst when we leave this building. Grant it, Lord. We know that we are living at the end time. And we ask you to bless us now as we further wait on thee and read thy word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Now, I'm going to read two or three places in the Scripture. And as I announced last Sunday, that today I was going to try to speak on Christianity versus idolatry. And that is our subject for this morning. And now, I'm not no theologian, not a Bible student by no means, just an illiterate person. It loves the Lord Jesus with all my heart. I do not claim to be a theologian or try to take one's place, but just try in the humbleness of my heart to explain those things that I feel that the Holy Spirit has revealed to me and I must give to my church, for it's to my interest that this church grows, that this church is spiritually right, it's to my interest because this church is God's interest and His interest is my interest. So I must see to this. Reading in the early historians of Irenaeus and them how they kept their church undefiled from the things of the world. How those old teachers got up there and really stayed with that gospel. The Bible wasn't written then in form as we have it now, not until the Reformation and Luther put it in print. But they, uh, they had what they called the gospel and apostle. Gospel and apostle. And they stayed with that. Now for our two places we aim to read this morning, one of them is found in the book of Jeremiah, the seventh chapter and beginning with 10th to the 18th verse, the other place is found in Acts 7, 49. And if you want to mark the text for this, or the text out of this, Jeremiah 7, it'd be the 18th verse. 
I want to begin reading from the 10th verse. And come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, We are delivered to do all of these abominations. Is this house which is called by my name become a den of robbers in your eyes? Behold, even I have seen it, saith the Lord. But go ye now unto my place, which was in Shiloh, where I set my name at the first, and see what I did for it, for the wickedness of my people Israel. And now, because ye have done all these works, saith the Lord, I spake unto you, rising up early and speaking, but ye heard not, I called you, but ye answered not. Therefore will I do this unto this house which is called by my name, wherein ye trust, and unto the place which I give unto you and to your fathers, as I have done to Shiloh. I will cast you out of my sight. I will have cast out all your brethren. I have cast out all your brethren, even the whole seed of Ephraim. Therefore, pray not thou for this people, pray not for this people, neither lift up and cry or prayers for them, neither make intercession unto me, for I will not hear thee. See thou not what they do in the city of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem? Now I want to stop before I read the final verse of this. Let me begin again now. God rebuking this people and saying, don't even pray for them. Let me begin with the 16th verse. And read through the 18th now. Listen close. Therefore pray not thou for this people, neither lift up cry nor prayers for them, neither make intercessions to me, for I will not hear thee, See thou not, seest thou not what they do in the city of Judea and in the streets of Jerusalem? The children gather wood, the fathers kindle fires, and the women knead their dough to make cakes to the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto other gods that ye may provoke me to anger. Now I wish to turn now in the book of Acts, the seventh chapter, and begin with the 44th verse and reading down to the 50th. Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness, as he has appointed speaking unto Moses that he should make it according to the fashion that he had seen which also our fathers that came in, brought in with Jesus unto the possession of the Gentiles, whom God drave out before our face of our fathers unto the days of David, whom found favor with God and desired to find a tabernacle for the God of Jacob. But Solomon built him a house. How be it? The Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as saith the prophet. Heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. What house will you build me, saith the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Now, you can see by the reading of the Scripture that where I'm placing my thought this morning up on idolatry first to begin with. There's little wrote about idolatry. There's not many books to explain idolatry. What is idolatry? And yet the world's full of it. 
I think the reason of it is, is because that it never really been explained to people, not knowing what it would be. And it's been my privilege and my great uh, privilege in my life and traveling to see some idolatry, to know what it is. And then in studying idolatry the last few weeks, mythology, Greek mythology and Roman mythology, then it brings me back to see whether they kill, still keep that same thing alive. See whether if idolatry remains as it was at the beginning. Today, in travel, seeing idolatry and then seeing the way it began, reading how it began back at, in the early days, I see that it hasn't changed. Now, I have been in India... India is full of idolatry. They have the firewalkers there and the different... I think one afternoon when I arrived in Bombay, I was entertained that afternoon by... I'm, somebody told me, I wouldn't know who was who, they're just in the temple of the Jains. And it was either 17 or 7 different religions, and I'm pretty sure it was 17 different religions had met me there in a challenge of the Word. And each one of them firmly against Christ. Seventeen different religions. And they was, they made us take our shoes off at the temple and come in and they set us down on pillows. And it would take some time to go through all the rigmarole, as I call it, we had to go through but the mayor of the city taking us in there himself was a Hindu, which is a Mohammedan. And Mohammed was a prophet. And he came out of the line of Ishmael, which was also a son of Abraham. And it was to this line that this famous evangelist in the world today that run from one of their men who challenged him to a showdown in the world. And to my opinion, the evangelist should have said, I have no gifts of healing, but our body of believers has such. You give me a few hours and I'll bring someone here. But of course, in doing that, then the evangelist would have exposed himself to the organizations that was backing him, and then he'd have been thrown out. And then on the second thought of it, I do not believe I would have let that unbeliever triumph over the Word of God. Amen. If I'd have been defeated, I'd still stood there and show my faith and belief in God that He remains the same. As the Hebrew children said, our God's able to deliver us in this fiery furnace, but nevertheless we'll not bow to your idols. Hmm. Yeah. I believe it would have been a more gallant thing. And then again, I, as being a doctor of theology and well posted in Scripture as the great evangelist is and a mighty man he is, I believe that I would have challenged him upon the word whether Jesus was a Christ or not or whether Mohammed was a prophet and approved him by his own Bible. If that would have been my call in the Bible as it is the evangelist to explain it, I would have taken that stand. Instead of just running from it, backing up, that showed, that don't show that real Christian courage. That'll stand there, live or die. God's able to deliver. I believe I would have called the hand of him on that. But they forget to think about Bombay when the blind man there, the Mohammeds, that night they received his sight in the meeting. They wouldn't mention that. But, however, on these people, they are not hypocrites. They are sincere people, just as sincere as you and I, and sometimes more than we are here in America. They are not hypocrites. They truly believe that and practice it with all that's in them. Let me give you a little something on idolatry. I forget the name of the God that is the God of the far walkers, but it's a huge statue with great big something similar to a human face. 
a kind of a cameo-like face, but huge big ears to hear all their sins and so forth. And great big rubies as earrings in their in his ears here that would probably cost half a million apiece, maybe. That might be overestimated. It may be underestimated. But, oh, such great costly jewels in this idol. And the priest of the temple brings the poor farmer. He doesn't have to be just an ordinary, don't have to be some special person. He's just an ordinary man, a farmer, that wants to give thanks to his God for a good crop. And in doing that, he shows his faith in God as he comes to the temple and is blessed by his priest. And then to getting ready to walk to a pool of coals that many feet deep and many feet wide and fan with fans until they're white hot. Now, it's no put on. It's truth. He goes before the idol confesses his sins to this priest and they pour water on him, holy water and so forth that the priest has blessed. And then many times they take a large hook, fish hook, great big, maybe a half inch to three quarters across the, the diameter across from the point to the back staff of the hook and they put a little ball of water on that like a little Christmas tree ornament and a little ball and fill it full of water to make it heavy. And they take literally thousands of those and hook them in their flesh, pull them out. As they go in, in their flesh, pull them to go through the torture to please their God. The idol. They're not hypocrites. Then many times they stick their tongue out and have a lance with a fork on it to go through their tongue and up through their nose and hold it together. Take stitches of thread and sew their mouth together if they said things wrong. And such torture. And then sit down by this uh, great pool of fire. They kill a goat to appease the idol to offer a life for their sins. And you ought to hear the, the rumble when that goat is killed. They confess their sins on it and kill the goat. Throw in the taking the blood as a, an atonement. And then if this firewalker, if he gets scared and runs to the fire, he brings reproach upon himself. But he must walk slow and study through these coals of fire. And sometimes there are many as 15 feet deep, these coals of fire. And maybe 15, maybe 15 feet deep and maybe uh, 30 yards or 40 yards long and about, oh, maybe 8 or 10 feet wide. And they're a white hot. And he has nothing on but a clout, which is a little loincloth like wrapped around the midst of him. And he gets out there with hanging with all this and bleeding and fish hooks and everything all over his body. Works himself up to into a frantic until white slobbers is pouring from his mouth. And here he comes walking through that fire and walk out on the other side unharmed at all. Through the fire and maybe his feet going that deep, legs down into the fire, two feet or better as he walks, pulling up them red hot coals on his human flesh. Walking through that fire and comes out on the other side unharmed. You can look at his feet, not a scratch or a scorch. And in watching so, and thinking if a sacrifice to a pagan idol with the blood of a goat, with faith in such would protect a heathen from fire, what would the blood of Jesus Christ do for the believer? Hallelujah. To a living God. Now, Idolatry is a strange thing. Down through the ages we've had it, ever since the, guess the beginning of time. Now, the order for this uh, idol worship is the man that sets up the idol, fixes the idol, then he goes in and prepares himself for this great uh, worship. 
Now, he believes that this idol is made in the image of some God that he doesn't, never, has never seen. He's without a farm. So he believes he's in the image of this idol that he makes to this God. Now, don't let that leave you. The image is in the image of the mythical God that he believes that is. Then he goes to afford this idol and prostrates himself and believes that the God that's an unseen person comes down into this idol and he believes that he talks to God through this idol. And God brings himself into this idol and answers him back. And many of you teachers here in as took uh, the mythology, even those gods, they had battles with one another, they claimed, and everything in those days. Now, in other words, the God hypnotizes himself from his supernatural standing into this idol and speaks back to the worshiper through this idol. And the worshiper, in some kind of a built-up, emotional sense believes that the idol speaks to him to his heart and he's forgiven of his sins and what more through this idol which plainly shows it's the devil it's the devil it does it and uh, they just don't just uh, do things uh, haphazardly some of them does but there's some real true worshipers of those things for instance, I can tell you stories of how those devils in those idols perform all kinds of things, make blood come out of things and everything else. They, they are, there are devils. And if you don't believe in a, there is really a devil, you don't believe there's a God. Amen. Sure, you've got to believe the contrary, the pro and con. So there is a real devil. And he is a person, not a thought. Amen, amen. He is a person. Right. Amen. Amen. Now, there's teaching goes on. It says the devil is just an, an evil thought you get. No, no, it isn't. The devil is a person. The same people believe that the Holy Ghost is just a, a good thought you get. But don't believe that. The Holy Ghost is a person. Amen. It's the person of Christ. In Amen. spirit form. Amen. Now, these idolaters, and you got your scriptures ready, or the places for your scriptures. I, I might refer to some of them in a few moments. Uh, the scriptures, we might read some. Now, uh, these idolaters prostrating themselves before the idol believe that the God that they are worshiping is represented in this idol. I, have you got that? That the worshiper is not a hypocrite. He actually is getting a hold of something that's in that idol. Because it comes back on him. He does something. Gets it from that idol, which is a myth god. Not a real one. And many times the devil gets into those things. And the devil gets into meetings sometimes. And impersonates himself as God. I have seen this in my ministry. Now remember, this is just, we're just teaching this morning. And I want this church, when I leave into the ministry here to go out in the fields, I want you to stay with your pastor and stay with the teaching that's been taught here. Stay with this word. Don't you leave it. You stay right with the word. No matter what comes or goes, stay with that word. Hallelujah. Now, and just because I go away, I'm just one of the pastors here. Brother Neville teaches the same thing I do. Amen. So just come right on to church and listen to the Word. I don't know where he's going to leave me. I told my wife this morning at the table, there's been something in me that's cried out all these years. I'm going to find out what it is. Oh, glory. Now, I don't know which way it'll lead, where it'll go. Well, where he leads me, I'll follow. Amen. Now, the idolatry, it's still today. 
We find, I find people coming to the altar with blind sayings of blind teachers. That'll say, just open up, forget everything, make your mind a blank. You'll become a, an Elijah. You'll become this or the other. What a lie. You don't come to God. That's opened up your soul. All kinds of devil spirits get in. But you do that. You must remember there is a devil. And he impersonates Christ to the letter almost. I was reading in the life of St. Martin some time ago that were a boy. He was actually a monk. And he said that God had called him to be one of the old prophets. You listen to me. I am one of the old prophets. And the school, Martin, of course, wouldn't listen to such a thing as that. So they didn't believe it because the boy's life didn't patter up to it. Finally, he said, I'm going to prove to you that I'm called to be an old prophet. Yes, the young fellow said, but I'm called. See, gifts and callings are without repentance. Amen. See, they get off the word. And when you get off the word, you get into anything. And this boy said, tonight around midnight, God is going to give me a white robe to set among you all with to show that I'm an old prophet. So they, that night they all listened and whispering come in and people traveling. And the boy received a white robe. When the visitor left, they went and looked at the robe. It was genuine, a real white robe. Looked very good, but the old bishop, he just couldn't get that. It didn't seem right because it just wasn't scriptural, a white robe. And when he did, they said, take this robe and go stand before St. Martin, that man of God. And he wouldn't do it. He wouldn't stand before that genuine prophet. He wouldn't stand and... They forced him to do it. And when they started to take him, the robe vanished and went somewhere they didn't know where it went. See? When it's brought to a showdown. If you've got genuine gold, you don't have to worry about whether it's good or not. It'll stand the trial anywhere. And the real Spirit of God will stand the trial because it's tried on the Word of God. Upon this rock I'll build my church. I've seen people get into hysterics. Good people. Now you can see why I don't want this tape sold. I've seen good people in Pentecostal people. Pastors who didn't understand. The people get into hysterics and fall into trances and everything like that. And and do things and finally run them into the insane institution. Is opening up their heart. Innocent people and devils came in. And taken place. There is a real devil. I was reading where one came to, I believe it was Irenaeus or Martin one. Some of the Bible students is better versed in this than I. Had a gold crown on his head, white robe on, shoes inlaid with gold, and said, I'm the Christ, confess me. That saint wouldn't do it. That real prophet of God stood there, waited, and they said two or three times to him, I'm the Christ, confess me. He said, our Christ don't come like that. That's right. You've got to know the Word. Amen. Stay on the Word. See, the great battle is at hand. Now, we played church for years and years. But the hours come now that when Jambres and Jambres will withstand Moses, as the Bible said they would. And it's going to be spiritual battle. Conflict. There will be some that's continuing on. The denominational church will just move right on into domination and go on the way it goes. But I mean the real true believer is coming to that battlefield. And you better be versed and know what you're doing. Or you can take an evil spirit so easy and not know if it's contrary to this word, don't believe it. Stay with that word. Idolatry. Idolatry is old. It's old here in the United States. And years ago, the Pueblo Indians in, out in Arizona, they had an idol worship. And that was they, they had a rain god. And the rain god was take a, a mud turtle. And they made an image of a mud turtle. And they put specks all over him. Like he'd come up out of the mud. And they would throw themselves before this mud turtle, believing that there was a rain god came down into this mud turtle, huh, and spoke to him through this 
mud turtle. Because they believe that the, he lived in the mud and moisture and he was a god over it. They had a, it's a mythology, just a, a make belief that it is true. Now, and they worship devils in doing so. Worshiping a mud turtle, thinking it was a rain god. They brought spirit upon them, sure, because they opened their hearts to it. But it was the wrong spirit. Amen. So many people today are opening their hearts to the wrong thing. You get a spirit, all right. But many times it contradicts the word. Saying the days of miracles is past. There's no such a thing as this or that. Remember, that's a devil. Under the disguisement of Christianity. God help us when we get down into this in a, after a bit. That you see it. See? That it's an evil spirit. In the disguisement of Christianity. But it isn't the spirit of Christ. Because the spirit of Christ comes to the word every time. He can't deny his own word. Now, when Christianity came to Rome. Rome, in the very city of Rome, had 400 pagan temples inside the seven-mile wall. 400 pagan temples. And they were to gods and to goddesses. Gods and goddesses, women and man. Gods. 400 different ones. Think of it. 400. Now... That's what Paul found when he come to Rome. That's what Aquila and Priscilla had when they were sent away from Pentecost and established the church in Rome. That's what they came into, pagan worship of idols. There was around two million people in Rome, in metropolitan Rome, that is the slaves and the outside suburbans and so forth, around two million people, but the walls around Rome was seven miles. And inside of that seven miles, right at the foot of the mountain, was 400 pagan temples, the pagan gods and goddesses. Now, I'd like to speak here just a moment on something I've taken from the histories, and I've got one right here with me. Um, the way they entered into worship. How did they come to worship? How did a pagan come to worship? The first thing he did was go to the temple and find the priest, the pagan priest. Then he would give him an offering of so much money and then a sacrifice, an animal, to appease the God that he was going to speak to. And in sometimes in one temple, there'd be more than one different kind of God. There'd be gods, goddesses and everything else in one temple. So the pagan priest, he would go to him and give him some money. And the pagan priest would give him back a candle. Just a regular tallow candle. And then the worshiper, taking this candle, after he had paid the priest, taking this candle and goes over to that certain altar of this God that he wanted to talk to. And on this altar was fire where the sacrifice would be burned. At the foot of the statue, the big bronze temple, or our idol, and he took this temp, this candle and lit it from the fire altar, the altar fire of the idol. He lit the candle and went down to the foot of the, the altar before the, the idol and set this candle down. And then, after he set the candle down, I guess it so the Certain God amongst all the other gods would know just which one of the statues he's supposed to get into, you know, to come back and talk to him. Why the candle, I don't know. But he'd set the candle down, lit off the altar fires, and then he would go back out in the floor of the tabernacle. And there he would prostrate himself on the floor. And there he would put all his soul all of his strength into his prayer and pray to this great God of some sort, uh, make-believe, uh, 
mythical God. Pray to this God to come down in this image and talk to him. It's said that one of the emperors could so prostrate himself before the image of Apollos that he could actually say that he heard voices coming from the, te- from the, from the idol, talking back to him, prostrating himself. You'd say at this point, Brother Branham, did he hear a voice? I do not doubt for what he did. But it was the voice of a devil. There was no such a thing as Jupiter, God, and all these other gods they had. But they prostrated themselves. And they laid there and worshipped. Worshipped this mysterious God that they know nothing about. While his spirit was in the idol that they thought he looked like. They made an image to him and that found favor with him. Then they made an offering. Then when he got himself all worked up into this emotion, he goes up again before the idol, and this time the pagan priest had brought him down some, some food and drink and set it at the feet of the idol. And then, now I've got it wrote out here on this page. I'm reading it right off. And he would go down to the foot of this idol and take some of this drink offering and sip it and nibble a little bit on the food and then pour it up on the feet of the idol. What was he doing? Having communion with devils. Communing with devils. Gods and goddesses. Just a a figurative type of the Christian communing with Christ. Eating the communion. That was a kind that the first church or the first pilgrims of the gospel that came to Rome found was in the, these people in this kind of worship. Baal was the most noted god of all the age of the idols. Was Baal. B-A-A-L. He was a sun god. And then he had a, a wife. The moon god. Goddess. Estra. I-S-H-T-R. Estar. And it's also pronounced A-S-T-A-R-T-E. Estre. It's on the Roman coin. She was called the goddess, moon goddess, or queen of heaven. Mother of gods. The moon god. And the sun god was Balaam. Well, nearly all the pagans worshipped that sun. Even the Indians was doing the same thing when, when we come found America here. When America was founded. Come, the fathers came here, they found that they were still worshiping the, the sun. Because in this, they worshiped, that's the way they were worshiping the gods and goddesses in Rome when the Christian arrived at Rome. Now in my travel, I have noticed that idolatry hasn't changed. And neither has true Christianity changed. They both hold their places and will until the coming of the Lord Jesus. On this, I'd like to speak just a little bit so you get an idea of it. And if you're spiritual, you surely will catch it. Because that Baal was a sun god... Well, the cakes that was made, as Jeremiah said here, we spoke of a few moments ago, the women had made cakes unto Baal, the sun god. Because you find out a little later on that down in the chapter, if you read it, that they said, if we don't uh, worship Baal, then our crops fail because Baal was a god of fertility. In other words, we know that the sun makes the crops to grow. But the prophet told him, it's because you forsaken God. Sure as your crops don't grow. But they worship Baal. Said they worship, make offerings to him. Now, if Baal is around God, uh, catch this word by word. And you'll get the rest of the ending of this message. God was around God, a sun God. They had great big brass plates that 
we reflect the sun, it looked like fire. And then the bread that Jeremiah said here, that they were, the women would bake these cakes into Baal, that it was made round like the sun. Well, then it was laid up on the altar, the pagan altar, for the communion, and uh, made round like the sun or like the moon because it was the sun god or the moon god. The Balaam, was, we said, is a god of all fertility. He makes everything to grow. Now, the early church come facing this when they come into Rome. And it is said and believed By the Roman church, or by the church today, or the Roman Catholic church, which is called Catholic, we're all Catholic. We are the Catholic church. We are the apostolic Catholic. The Catholic means universal. And we are the universal church of the apostolic faith. Amen. Yes, sir. There's a difference between the two churches. One of them was Catholic, universal, apostolic. The other one was Roman Catholic. And it was said that Peter, or they believe it, that Peter established the Roman church. I want the scripture, I want the place that you can say that Peter was ever in Rome. Under any condition. As a Roman church said, he was there from 41 to 46. And at that very same time, Claudius was emperor in Rome, which made all the Jews leave. Read Acts the 18th chapter and you'll find out that Paul, when he went up into Ephesus, he found Aquila and Priscilla, which was actually Jews and had been uh, taken out during the time of the persecution. And they were here in Palestine again because Claudius had commanded all Jews to leave, both Christian and Orthodox. Aquila and Priscilla established the church in Rome, and they had to leave because of the rising of Claudius had taken all of the church, uh, the Christians and all the Jews out of Rome. Now, Peter being the bishop of the church, and I can show you scripture plumb on down to at least nearly 70 years that Peter never was out of Palestine. Hallelujah. Right in the scripture. Amen. And you say that Peter was murdered in Rome and Paul had his head cut off in Rome. That's dogma. I've read all of the martyrologies I can find, and there's not one of them that states anything about Peter or Paul, either one being killed in Rome. Or the earliest authentic martyrologies that we can read, there's none of them that says anything about it. It wasn't. It's a dogma. I'm here to expose paganism. So we're, we're going to do that by the help of the Lord and His Word. Just show you how the churches. You're hollering about Catholic, but just wait a few minutes. Now, now we find out that after Aquila and Priscilla, according to Scripture, was taken out of Rome, the little church was left as an orphan. All was in there were converted pagans that came over into the Roman Christian church, the early church. That Aquila and Priscilla and another couple that had established this church and had nourished it. Then we find out as soon as they left that they made their own bishops and took their own doctrine. And then they adopted to find favor with the emperor, Constantine, and those who later came to find favor because they had to get members in there to stand in the political uh, holdup of the nation. They brought in members of the church and take them in on perfect just confession, knowing no more about God than some of these people we got in America today does. Yeah, Just as a profession, which was a great big mouthful for them to profess Christ, another God besides their own God. And in there, they adopted into their constitution of the church pagan ceremonies. Yeah, Amen. Now, the Roman priest, then they adopted this by taking and making the communion. The first thing come up was making the communion instead of a broken parcel like the body of Christ, they would make it round like the sun or like the moon. And to this day, 
It's still round. Sure. It's still a round wafer. And not a broken piece of his body. It's round and smooth. Roman priests today lay this round wafer on the altar and call it the literal body of Christ. Now, uh, there's a great stand back between some of these Episcopalians and so forth and the Catholic Church is up on that subject. Whether it is the literal body or it represents the body. The Roman Catholic says it is the literal body. Because that was the literal body of Baal. The sun god that reflected itself on that piece of brass. And it made it round. No Christian table has round bread on it. Then they want to face the east and so forth like they did in the pagan worship and bring women in and so forth just like they've always did like the pagans and the goddess and so forth. Now, they just taken down uh, Esther and put up Mary. Made her the queen of heaven. They had taken down Jupiter and put up Peter. And they had to get a dogma. In order to do that, they had when Aquila and Priscilla returned back after 13 years of the reign of Claudius, then when they returned back, they found their church completely given to idolatry. But it grew to a mammoth big thing. In order to bring this in, they must absolutely take away the Bible. Now, I'm an Irishman. I've got what I call facts of our faith that belongs only to a priest and so forth. And I know this. With interviews with priests, the priest will not argue you the Bible. The Bible is just another book to him. When this year Bishop Shane said here about two years ago that anybody tried to believe the Bible like walking through muddy waters. They don't believe that. They started there and they said God is in his church. Not his word. This priest up here on the road that came for the interview recently up here at the Sacred Heart. He said to me, or this church up the road, I forget what it is. I think it's called Sacred Heart. He come to me about the baptism of Mary Elizabeth Frazier who had backslid and turned to be a Catholic. He said, did you baptize her? I said, yes. He said, how did you baptize her? I said, in Christian baptism. He said, what way do you mean? I said, there's only one Christian baptism. He said, what do you mean? By immersing? I said, yes, sir. He said, you immersed her then in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. I said, that's not Christian baptism. I said, Christian baptism is immersing in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. He put it down. He said, will you swear to this oath, to, uh, this declaration to the bishop? I said, if he can't believe my word, let him do without it. I said, I don't swear by nothing. See? And he said, um, and I said, not to be arrogant, sir. But I don't, the Bible said, don't swear by heavens or by earth because it's his footstool and so forth. We're not supposed to do that. He said, strange, the Catholic Church used to baptize like I said, when? When? See? But they say that they did it. Because, frankly, they were, and we were all one at the beginning, and of the origin, origin come from Pentecost. Amen. That's the beginning of the first church anywhere anybody Amen. can talk about. Amen. The Christian church began at Pentecost. With a Pentecostal experience. Pentecostal people. Pentecostal baptism. All come from the uh, original church at Pentecost. Yeah. Now, notice. Now, we find out then that they had to get away from the Bible teaching in order to have these things to please the emperors and so forth, to bring in pagans. Now look, Peter was a Jew. Is that right? Could you imagine... St. Peter adopting the idea of putting up idols in a church? A Jew who was forbidden to even look around an idol? Could you imagine him doing a thing like that? Not Peter. Could you imagine him saying, All my writings back there in the beginning was all wrong. I just throw them down now. And I'm going to live as a spirit in this Roman church. And I'm going to adopt what be a changed man. Therefore, to do that, they had to start a dogma that Peter was buried in the church and they left all the commandments with them and they were the original Catholic church. They're not. There's no scripture. There's no history. There's nothing to prove it. 
Not a thing. They wasn't. And that pagan priest of the first Roman church is just exactly like the same one today. They believe that that bread is the body of Christ. That somehow Christ comes down and jumps into that piece of bread laying on the altar that the mice will pack away overnight. See, and that's the reason the Catholic bees, you must go to the church to worship because God is in that church. That's the reason they bow and cross themselves around the church. Because that piece of bread is God. It's nothing but a representation of a Balaam sun God. No scripture to it at all. Yes, that round wafer laying on the altar. Now, therefore, they did not accept the Christian teaching that Irenaeus, Polycarp, and those early brethren, Paul, we find out the oldest disciple was lived the longest with John, his exile three years out on Patmos because he had a school. He was transmitting or fixing the Word of God, putting it together, the epistles together. They found him and his scholars are doing it, and the excommunicated him for three years. At the death of the emperor, he was brought back. And then he wrote the book of Revelations. And talk about God in his church or God in his word. The Bible said that the word is God. Amen. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Amen. Besides, any teaching of any church, let it be Baptist, Presbyterian, Methodist, Pentecostal or whatever it may be. That don't stay letter by letter with this Bible is wrong. Amen. For John said in the Isle of Patmos, the Holy Spirit, or Christ speaking to him, said this, If any man shall take anything out of this or add anything to it. Amen. So how are you going to add these pagan idol worship symbols making three God out of one? And all these other pagan affairs with your early church never taught it and was against it. Amen. The Nicaea Council, whether it was three substance or one substance, the great debate, them martyrs come up there, some of them with, uh, with one guy that, the bishop, Pentecostal preacher, for laying hands on the sick, they put a hot rod across his arms and pulled his arms back like this. Others standing where they take a sword and gouge his eyes out. Looked like a bunch of martyrs. That stood for this word. Hallelujah. Amen. They mingle her blood with the prophets of old. This word, brother, it's God's word. Amen. When these pagans were converted, they brought in these symbols unto Christianity. They cannot use the Bible anymore because the Bible exposed this. And they'll tell you right today that they don't have, they don't believe that. They say it's all right. But the church is the supreme word. Well, we find the same thing in Pentecost. Amen. Don't holler about Catholic when we're just as guilty as the Methodist, Baptist, and every one of them. Amen. You Methodist so holy, why'd you kill Joseph Smith then? This is America, the right to worship. I don't believe what Joseph Smith said, but you had no right to kill him. Right! The Mormon. Amen. You Baptists, how many of you covered up? The rest of you. And Pentecost. Just as guilty as the rest of them. Becomes a stuffed shirt. And a bunch of hypocrisy. And instead of the humility and the power of the Spirit, you've got the Word without the Spirit. Amen. You do more harm than you would if you was like the rest of them. Back in their pagan ceremonies of all kind of Trinitarian ideas and all this other stuff. You can't prove it by the Word. The Word's contrary to it. How pitiful. How pitiful. So, when they formed the first church of Rome, the Christianity, they had to dismiss the Bible and to take up these ceremonies. In order to do it, they had to have some kind of a background. So they said, Peter was the first Pope of Rome and he still remains that way. They say, well, let's say he was. Would Peter back down on the words of Pentecost? No. no. Oh, amen. Could you imagine a Jew setting up idols? Amen. 
And when I can prove to you by written word out of the Bible exactly the days and years that Peter never did leave Palestine but one time and went to Babylon down by the Euphrates. Never was in Rome. By the Scriptures, thus saith the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. It's all a pagan idea. Now we're going to bring that right out into Protestantism. Look at Pentecost. Without taking the word. Stay with that word and you're always right. Get off that word you'll go anywhere. Here some time ago at a great meeting with a big Pentecostal school. A woman got, jumped up speaking in tongues and interrupted the altar call. And that night when I come back in, Billy met me out there and said, You know what? That woman said she had another message tonight she's going to give. Now I looked at the woman. Bobbed hair. A dress on so tight looked like she was poured into it. Set that back, fixing her hair, pulling up her stockings. I know she's going to jump up. And she jumped up and I said, Sit down! Amen. She just kept on. I said, Do you hear me? Sit down! Oh, my. When I went out that night, there's the four or five of the guys met me out there with her. Said, You grieve the Spirit. I said, Any spirit that I grieve with the Word of God ought to be grieved. Amen. Amen. I said, don't the Bible say that the spirit of the prophets is subject to the prophet? If she's testifying which prophecy is, is speaking in tongues, is prophecy if it's interpreted? I said, then let her wait till I am finished. Amen. Then she can have it. He said, but you're teaching the word. I said, that's what I'm standing by. He said, she had something fresh and new from heaven, something different from that. If that isn't back to Roman Catholicism, I don't know what it is. Amen. Let every man's word be a lie and every spirit be a lie and God's word be the truth. Amen. God's word's first. Yes. Amen. Such a trouble today. They have so many revelations and false things. It's prostrating themselves out there and opening up their heart to devils instead of staying with God's word. Amen. That's where the trouble is. That's what's the matter. People... Honest, sincere, good people. But you can't tell them, well, we believe this is Pentecostal people. We believe this is Baptist people. I believe this because it's a Word of God. Amen. I challenge anybody to correct me in it. Amen. Try it. This is the Word. Stay with this. This is true. So they formed the first church, the first Roman Catholic church. And instead of calling the and Bishop, which you always had called him, now they call him Father. They still do. And they say, You're, you have to admit it, that this wafer is the body of Christ, and it, so far the priest is a God because God is obliged to listen to the voice of the priest that changes this wafer to the literal body of Christ. Wow. And then, smart man, let that be poked down their throat. Oh, my. Oh. How. But the true worshipers, the true bishops, stayed with the Word. Amen. They stayed right there in that Nicaea Council. They held that Word right there. Yes, sir. They come in like martyrs. Everything else, but they stayed with that Word. They want to know idolatry at all. And I want somebody to show me where St. Patrick was ever a Roman Catholic. There is no such thing. He protested that Roman church. He was a nephew of St. Martin. I was reading here in a woman that wrote a Hazelton, Mrs. Hazelton, in excerpts of the Nicene Council, said that she went to the card at um, Oxford to get the, the card for the, um, the, uh, the life of St. Uh, Martin. And this fellow said, but he wasn't canonized <laughs> by the Roman church. Certainly not. He protested the thing. And so did St. Patrick. The man who stayed with the Word of God built their own schools. They got away from them kind of things. Now, we find out. So it is today. The Roman church continues right on with their same round biscuit, believing that Christ comes down and jumps in. And listen, do you know the priest drinks the wine? One there to take it one with another. He passed the cup one to another. But in the pagan form, the priest drank the wine. 
See, you still, it's all pagan. Just exactly. They don't care. They tell you, I won't talk to you about no Bible. That minister or priest said to me up there, said, Mr. Bram, you're trying to talk about a Bible. I'm talking about a church. I said, God is the Word. Amen. Right. Now, all right, we find it this, to this day. That's why the Roman Catholic Church has to go to church to worship. They are taught that God is in this round wafer. The host in the tabernacle. Can't you see that's pagan? Amen. Sure it is. Can't you see that people that will adopt anything... Anything contrary to this word is the same outfit. Amen. Didn't the Bible in Revelation 17 call the Catholic Church a whore? Amen. Didn't it call the Protestants a mother of, and she was a mother of harlots? Amen. The same thing. She'd give out doctrine from her cup of the filthiness of the abomination of her fornications. Amen. Dirt and filth of makeup of mere man. Instead of the word of the living God, which is true and unadulterated. Oh, God, have mercy on us in my prayer. Irenaeus said, I wrote down a note here what he said. Said the word of God is like a fine bunch of nice big jewels that was placed out to make a statue of a great mighty king. But said creeds. Dogmas, denominations, take those beautiful jewels and make a form of a dog out of it and deceive the ignorant of the word. This they do to corrupt the ways of God and to bring a reproach upon it. Hallelujah. You try to make the word of God say something to fit your organization. You're taking the jewels out of the great king's body and making an image of dog or a fox or a hog or something out of it. And you deceive the ignorant of the word. Hallelujah. There's some who has the spirit of God that stands for the word incarnate. God increase our ranks. The word, nothing but the word. Take that word where Jesus said, In there all heavens and earth will pass away, but my word shall not. Where it said, Baptize in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. They make Father, Son, Holy Ghost, three gods out of it. They take all kinds of dogmas and make up all kinds of things and sprinkling the city of mercy. Everything. Make some kind of a man-made waller out of it. Amen. Instead of putting it in the jewel in the great King Christ. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. That's God. Incarnate Christ. They corrupt the ways of God. Let the people come into church. Women with bobbed hair wearing makeup, dresses on. It looks scandalous. Man! So sissified. Let a woman lead him around by the ear. Come to the church and play bunko and bingos and all kinds of corruption things and preachers and so forth out on banks of naked women dressed in bathing suits and going swimming, smoking cigarettes and calling themselves servants of God when this temple is a holy temple dedicated to God, not the filth of the world. It's true. But they've taken the jewels of God and made a hog out of it or a fox or a dog or a polecat. Or something. And feed it to the unlearned. The ignorant. Thank you, Doc. I had one here, but I just didn't think about using it. Thank you. Yes. That's what they do. Irenaeus is so right. What does God think about all of this? Is it just like what they try to say? Oh, it doesn't matter to him. It does matter to him. It is matter. Why do you tell Jeremiah the things that he did then? Why did he say that? It does matter. God's got away. What if Moses said, I'll take off my hat instead of my shoes? You'd have never saw the vision. You've got to come God's way. God has a way. There's so much we can say. Let's just turn to one scripture here. I got it. Many of them wrote down. Let's turn to Numbers 25. <clears throat> 
Yes, ma'am. Numbers 25, we see whether it matters anything to God or not. Let's see if it does. Where are these creeds, dogmas, and so forth? doesn't matter. He's a good God. He just overlooks the whole thing. He doesn't. He lays a line and draws a plummet, and you've got to come to it. And Israel abode and shed him. And the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. Listen. And they called the people unto the sacrifice of their gods. And the people did eat and bowed down to their gods. And Israel joined himself unto uh, Baal Pirah. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. Amen. No wonder he said, don't pray for that kind of people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take all the heads of the people and hang them up before the Lord against the sun, that the fierce anger of the Lord may be turned away from Israel. And Moses said unto the judges of Israel, Slay ye every one his man that joined unto Baal Pirah. Slay every one of them. God wants to be God. If he ain't God, he ain't going to be second place. Amen. You don't have to let Baal and some man make dogma and some uh, fury of some man or some idea of a creed or some idea of a, of a denomination stand in his way. He's God and he's able of these stones to rise children to Abraham. Amen. You don't have to have your denominations. Amen. You don't have to have your big societies, your schools and things. He takes what he can get in his hands. It's nothing. Breathes a breath of life into it and it becomes something. That'll serve you. That's what makes him God. Certainly it matters to God. You say it doesn't matter. It does matter. Certainly it matters. Pope Leo the Great. He reigned in from 440 unto 461. Oh, he thought he was exactly doing what was right. Coming to the church before him was Victor. And he was a rat too. And he come in there and how he put the Christians to death and everything else. And then who started all this putting and legalized murder? You know who it was? St. Augustine of Hippo. That's exactly who did it. St. Augustine had an opportunity once, so says the history, to become a great man and be filled with the Holy Ghost. He sat in the back of the yard there in Lyons, France, at the great school where Irenaeus had taught. And, and St. Martin... He said in this schoolyard, and the Holy Ghost come to him, but he refused to accept it. Then what he become? A two-fold child of hell, and he was to begin with. Amen. Went right on down to Hippo, Africa. There he said his school, and it was, show me, I can take you to the history. He was the one who sanctioned his word to it, that it was all right to put to death any heretic who would disagree with the dogmas of the Roman church. Amen. St. Augustine. Of Hippo. Is there a Bible scholar here or somebody that's read history knows that that's true? Raise up your hand. Yeah, see, I'm sure they're St. <laughs> Augustine of Hippo. He was one who passed the verdict that it's all right to kill heretics who disagree with the Roman church, sanction them pagan doctrine or getting away from the Bible and establishing a sun god worship. You know the reason Christianity is? You know where you got Christmas? Christ was born in April. Amen. Well, what did they do? The solar system is slowing up now as it gets away. Each day getting a little longer, a little shorter, a little shorter. And from the 20th until the 25th is when the sun God had its birthday. It's, it's about five days there. That's when they had the Roman circus. At that time, the celebration of the sun God's birthday. At that time. And now you see what you got now? They said, make it the sun God. Let's take it son of God. The whole thing is pagan to begin with. Amen. And the people on the streets with their high heeled shoes and they're twisting up and down the streets and running to stores. And here the other day, my wife is telling me, someone said, I don't know what to get daddy. He said, a brother's going to give him a quart of whiskey. And the other said, he's going to give him some champagne. And one said, well, I'm going to give him a, a poker set. Celebration of Christmas. Pagan. Devil worship. Amen. All right. But Augustine sanctioned it. If you want to refer to this in Smucker's, the writing of Smucker. S-C-H-M-U-C-K-E-R-S. Smucker's. The glorious reformation. Here's what is stated. 
that from the time that St. Augustine of Hippo passed this verdict to the Catholic Church that throw the doors wide open for them to kill anything they wanted to then, that denied that pagan church, and from the time of St. Augustine, about 300 years after Christ, until 1850, the great massacre of Ireland, there was 86 million Protestants killed by the Catholic Church. That's on the Roman martyrology. 86 million. Now, plus with the historian, he's the one who said that. I'm just repeating his word. Everyone that disagreed with the Catholic dogma, not Catholic, the word Catholic, they don't, they don't deserve that name. There are Roman pagans, not those precious people. There's tens of thousands of them people out there just as sincere as them, any other idolatry is. They think that they're worshiping God. When back to the word, they're in an idol. Well, idols all over the place. See, all right. It was a dog, dogma, Roman dogmas. And listen, I want to state something here. I'll pass that. In the year of 1640, in the year of 1640, when Ireland's slaughter came on under the Roman Justites and the priest, 100,000 of St. Patrick's converts was killed. If St. Patrick was a Roman Catholic, then why did they kill their own people? Then we're factory working people and everything. That's right. 100,000 on the martyrology that they put to death because they disagreed with the teaching. I've been to some of St. Patrick's churches in Northern Ireland. Yes, sir. I had the privilege of seeing that. It's just a big old hall. They didn't have them idols sticking up and pouring stuff on their feet and paying for them people to come back and get that idol. Mary, hail Mary, mother of God. The same thing as they did to Esther. Bewitching the spirit of Mary. Just two or three years ago, the Catholic Church started a new dogma that Mary had rose up from the dead and has gone into heaven. How many remembers that? Oh, all of you do. It's just papers is full of it. Dogmas. It's built up on dogmas and not one speck of truth nowhere. Now, you Protestants are just as bad that refuse to take the Word of God. This dogma of the Protestant church is the same as the dogma of the Catholic church. And we're all together wrong till we get back to the Word of the living God. Amen. Hallelujah. You assemblies of God, you four square, you Pentecostal oneness, threeness, whatever you may be, come back to the Word of God. Amen. Quit some of these your denominational idols. Denominational speaks. They bewitch themselves, the spirit of the devil, into these denominational idols. Do you know that? Amen. Denomination is an idol. Amen. You say, are you a Christian? I'm Presbyterian. Are you a Christian? I'm a Methodist. Are you a Christian? I'm Pentecostal. That don't mean more than what you're a hog or a dog or a skunk. Amen. Has more to do with it. It's right. What we need today is back to the Word of God. Amen. Now, of these shop workers and precious people in Northern Ireland, if St. Patrick, where all of his schools was, you know, his name wasn't Patrick. His name is Suscat. He was kidnapped as a little boy. His sisters was killed. And he returned back because he trained dogs to chase hogs and so forth. So he, uh, he, he, he did, when he did that, then they, he found his way back home to his father and mother. And he started a school. And the school in Northern Ireland never did accept the Pope as the supreme vicara of God. They didn't believe it. They stayed with the Word. God bless that blessed Saint, St. Patrick. Great man. And you hear him say that St. Patrick run all the snakes out of Ireland? Read the history and see what it was. St. Patrick believed in speaking in tongues. St. Patrick believed in taking up serpents or drinking deadly things. And when he could pick up a snake and throw it out of his way, they said he runs snakes out of Ireland. It's because he believed in taking up serpents. Nothing would harm them. Yes. Oh, sure. They didn't have those, these great big shrines. And what would, what would a saint, what would Irenaeus do today? What would St. Patrick do today to see the hundreds of billions of dollars placed into the Roman Catholicism? To build big churches and million dollar statues and everything. Just the same as the Protestants are doing. I made a statement the other day that stumped everybody. That's the reason I'm holding this tape. 
You just let them alone. The blind leads the blind. Let them fall in the ditch. That's the only thing you can do. When I told them about altar calls. There was no such a thing in the Bible as altar calls. Of His holiness. By humbling ourselves to His death. Reckoning ourselves nothing. Then the Holy Ghost comes in and lifts us up. Amen. And we don't trust in ourselves because we can do nothing. But with Him we can do all things. We in His image... A living image of a living God. What does you, when you surrender yourself to God and God comes into you, what does it make you? A living image of God. Not a dead statue set in the corner. Amen. Not a denomination up in the headquarters at Washington and the, and the, and the Confederation of Churches. Amen. <laughs> no, that's a dead statue. A dead statue and a dead creed. But a living image, an individual. Somebody was teaching the other day, or I had a little note on somebody said, that if a man wasn't saved, and if a man was saved and his wife wasn't saved, would they go in the rapture? The woman couldn't go in the rapture. There'd be no such a thing as a woman going in the rapture because they're one. Nonsense. Yes. Jesus said there'll be two in a bed and I'll take one and leave one. Amen. It's an individual affair Amen. between you and God to surrender your body, whether mama, papa, children, or anything else receives it or not. Amen. Oh, God, this corruptible, dirty, filthy world. These dirty, filthy churches called so-called churches. These dirty, filthy organizations. These dirty, filthy creeds that's against the Word of God. Oh, Amen. God, bring a humble little person somewhere and clean them out. Amen. Lift them up in heavenly places and show yourself, Almighty God. Amen. What a corruptible thing has come to be. We are made partakers of His holiness. We in His image. We are living images of a living God. Then dead to self, raised with Him. Now listen, listen to this. His Word made flesh again in us. Hallelujah. Oh, brother. That's good enough. Hallelujah. Look, what is it? All right. Not the mythical, imaginary God sitting out there. But the living God. What is the living God? The Word in you. Amen. Making itself real. Amen. God, oh, I know you think I'm a holy roller. Maybe I am. But, oh, brother, do you see it? Triumph over every denomination. Triumph over all paganism. A living God made manifest in a living temple. And the Word of God, which is God, is made flesh in you. Why? You're seated in heavenly places, triumphed over all things in Christ Jesus. Amen. Oh, I just love it. I have to skip something and go on. Now, listen. Then the least of his believers, no matter how, how long, who little, who little, or how, whatever you are, the least of his believers in him has all evil under them. See, look, Christ is the head of the body. Is that right? Amen. Well, wherever the head is, the body's with it. Glory! Right. Where my head goes, it takes my body with it. Amen. And where Jesus is, the church is with Him. Amen! Amen. He don't get out of His Word. Amen. He stays in His Word, watches over it to make it manifest. Oh, amen. His church is with him. And look, you say, but Brother Branham, I'm the least one. That's the soles of his feet. But remember, he's triumphed with you, triumphed with you over every bit of it, even your soles of your feet. Every sickness, every devil, every power, even death itself is under your feet, under you. Yeah, amen. All right. Glory. That's good. Amen. I don't feel like I'm 52 I'm this morning. Mm. Right. This is truth. If I can just get this church to see that, brother, we will be a triumph church. Mm. Believers in Him, all evil under Him. All glory. I'm going to check up a little. I'll start up again the next time. Listen. Listen to this. You say, Brother Branham, I have no power. Neither do I. I don't have any power. Or, Brother Branham, I'm a weakling. So am I. But I'm not depending on my strength. It ain't my strength. I'm depending on my authority. Amen. Oh, amen. 
See, my authority given me. It's not me strong. I ain't strong. He's strong. Amen. And I, I'm his here like this. Say, for instance, here's a tra- traffic coming down the street at 4th and Broadway in Louisville. Zoom, 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 zoom as fast as you can. 60 miles an hour across that street. Everybody rushing and hustling, bustling. <laughs> One little man walks out there, raises his hand, and brother breaks slide. <laughs> Well, that little man has got enough power to stop one of those cars. But he's got authority. Glory! It ain't his power. Well, if one of them cars they hit him, it demolish him. But let him raise his hand. Why? The drivers of the car recognize that uniform. Oh, brother. They recognize that uniform break slide. Why? Look at his authority. Look what's behind him. The whole system of the city is behind him. The law enforcement of the city is behind him. That uniform represents that. He's different. Yes, sir. Because he's an officer. Y'all are stop. Well, one of them cars goes zoop and just take him like that. But they better not try it. Look what's behind him. They'll squeak, brakes, and slide. <laughs> he don't even have to say a thing. Just raise his hand. That does it. Sure. His authority comes from the law enforcement. It's all behind him. His self, he's weak. But what's behind him? That's what starts. His dress. He's all dressed up in a uniform. That's what the... Not the idol... But what the individual are to be dressed. Let us put on the whole armor of God. Amen. Amen. The helmet of salvation. This great big shield the size of a door. The faith. <laughs> oh, brother. It's not what he is, but what he represents. I thought the officer. It ain't that little man standing there. He's just an ordinary man. But what he represents... Our armor is Jesus Christ. Yes, sir. All devils slide their brakes. When you see that? <laughs> they see that a full armor of God, the true baptism of the Holy Ghost. Amen. 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 That seated, coming straight from the throne of God, dressed in the full armor of His resurrection. Amen. Not that you're strong, you're nothing. It's what's behind you. Amen. Why? You are dead. You join the army. You join the police force. Hallelujah. You're going to keep law and control of these devils. That's right. Hallelujah. You're on the police force. Hallelujah. The whole thing's behind you. Amen. See? You're reckoned dead. You're nothing. You couldn't stop nothing. Hallelujah. But your authority that's been given you because you're raised and setting in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, the devil recognizes that. Hallelujah. Everything slides its brakes. When them hands goes up, St. <laughs> Martin, one time in a court, there's a man down there lacerating a devil. He's biting big hunks out of people like that, and people's running, he's trying to kill him, pulling big hand, had great big tusk teeth. He's jerking out big mouthfuls of flesh like that as he uh, uh, messed around. Yeah. Worshippers. And the days that he saw ahead and knowed it would be this way, when he himself would be turned out of his own church. The lady of sin church, she said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. That organization had turned him out. And they have done it today. But he stands at the door to knock. Oh, God, may the members of his body realize today that we're in the church triumphant. We are, we are in Christ. We're seated above all these things of the world. Why would our women want to cut their hair? God, it shows something's wrong why would they want to expose themselves in sexy looking things? Why would our people have hunger in their hearts to hear a, a guy like Elvis Presley or, or some of these Rickies or so forth stand up there as an old guitar and that old squeaky music and make our young girls sway and jerk their underclothes off and things? God, and then that boy claims to be Pentecostal. Oh God, what is. Look at this Pat Boone who claims to belong to the Church of Christ. All these vulgar, dirty things. Oh, God. Calling himself from the church of Christ. God, we realize that the badge of authority is not a name of a denomination, 
but it's the power, the power of the resurrection of Christ in each individual life. God made this people here this morning strive to enter in that. And if this tape should ever get out into the country where people are at, Lord, let them know that it wasn't said to be for malice because I'd be wrong myself, but that the church might be triumphant and realize its place. Yeah. That they'd see where all these idols, where the Catholic Church come out plain and made it an idol, the Protestants makes it an organization and just as bad. Denying the word. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Oh, God, how true your word is, every word. Now we pray, Father, that you'll forgive us of our sins. And may this message sink deep into the heart. And may the people, may this church, as this little tabernacle now, is in the building process of building a church. May they never look to some beautiful something, but just enough to shelter the people. God, may they never go to look and say, we belong to the big tabernacle, has got the big dome on it. God, let it be an empty hull. Amen. May they never lose sight of the object of Jesus Christ. May He be the one that fills their temple. And then the power and fire of the Holy Ghost will fall on the altar of their hearts. There's where the real altar is, Lord, is on the heart of each individual. I pray this morning that this Word will lay so heavy on the altar of every heart that they'll never be able to get away from it, that they'll come sane and sensibly to the gospel, believing the words and not open their heart to demon powers or sensations or squeaking or jumping or, or some manifestation, some physical form or something like that, but to the real, true, loving Spirit of Christ where He'll manifest Himself in love and power. Grant it, Lord. Heal the sick and the afflicted. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. I love you. upon the altar and make it a field to God that he might sow his word upon the altar of your heart that would bring forth the life of the resurrection of Christ. Would you raise your hands and say, God, I desire this with all my heart. God, bless your hungry hearts. Dozens after dozens. Leave it there. Just leave it there. Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. If we trust and never doubt, he will surely bring us out. Take our burden to the Lord and leave it there. Right in your heart, remember Christ the Savior. Remember He died for you. And if you'll just die to yourself, that'll empty your body, empty your soul, empty your heart of everything of this world and all of its pleasures. Then Christ, you'll raise with Him. If you haven't been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, there's a pool full of water here. And when you raise up out of that water, you're arising to walk with Christ in a new life. You are dead then. You're no more tempered. Everything's gone away. You're a new creation in Christ. Then He raises you up with the Holy Ghost and sets you in heavenly places with Himself far above all powers of this world. No matter how little, if you're a little washwoman, if you're, if you're just a brother that don't have it, knows ABCs, don't make any difference who you are. You're a in Christ triumph over all things. And your authority is over every demon and every power that the devil has. You're in Christ's triumph. While you have your heads bowed, I know that there's a brother come down here this morning, Brother Slink, I believe he called him. Saint, Jim Saint, who I believe to be, our brother has recognized, to be a teacher of this Word. Isn't that right, Brother Saint? 
We're to lay hands on him this morning just before we pray for the sick. To ordain him a minister, one of our brothers. Amen. To go out to the churches to preach the gospel. Amen. Brother Jim Sink, will you come up here to the altar? Come, Brother Neville. <laughs> Brother Junie Jackson, are you here? Any of the other ministers of this faith? Hallelujah. Brother Jim Sink here believes in this gospel that we preach, the Son of God. I believe that He is truly the virgin-born Son of God. Is that right, Brother Slim? You believe that He died and rose again the third day, triumphed over everything and sitting at the right hand of God in the center of God's power on high, ever living to make intercessions Amen. for us. You believe in the water baptism in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Amen. You believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit just as God will give it with signs and wonders to follow the believer. Amen. He believes that. And I believe He has a life that's unreproachable before the people. He preaches here at the church often for them here. Now I find out a wonderful man of God. Now to this church, is there any word in here, any man that's got a contrary word against Brother Sling? Say it now. Or forever hold your peace. How many believe that with the preaching of this message and this word that Brother Sling, and you believe with by the witness of the Holy Spirit that Brother Sling should be ordained and sent from this church here as a minister of the gospel to proclaim these messages like has been preached this morning that everywhere the, he can go in the world, the Lord will send him. Raise your hands and say, I will be praying for you, Amen. Brother Lord. God bless you. Let us bow our heads, Brother Neville, if you lay your hands on Brother Saint, while you lay your hand on the Bible. Our Heavenly Father, we bring to you this morning a man that has been brought up out of the corruption of this world, has reckoned himself dead to himself, and has accepted Jesus, Christ as Savior, been baptized into the name of Jesus Christ, raised up with the promise of receiving the Holy Ghost, and now in heavenly places, and feels a call on his life to the ministry. Oh God, as elders of this church, as an assembly and the general overseers and so forth, to watch the flock of which the Holy Ghost has made us a carer for, the flock raising their hand, that knowing of Brother Saint that he's a just man. We therefore lay our hands upon him, as Brother Neville and I, as your elders. And by this we pray the prayer of faith and ordain Brother Jim Saint into the ministry of Jesus Christ. Granted, may he be filled with the power of God. May he never compromise. May he win souls to you. And God, we pledge our loyalty and brotherhood to him to back him up wherever he is in prayer and in help in any way we can. Receive him, O God, as we present him to you in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. We thank you, Jesus. With your hands upon the word. And there, my brother, saying, I ordain you a brother in Christ and our fellowship in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you. Hallelujah. Amen. And the congregation said, Amen. 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 God bless you. With much to do in the gospel. Badly needed. We are behind you 100% with everything that we can Hallelujah. do. Hallelujah. God bless you. Isn't he wonderful to be a... Oh, my, I like to see, man. That's fine. He's, as I understand now, he's taking over the pastoral of the Holiness Tabernacle at Utica, Indiana, for which he lives not far from there. Now... Let's see. Or have we got? Oh, I believe we got sick to pray for yet, haven't we? Or did they? Get, you get us some prayer cards. All right. Let's call a few prayer cards right quick. This everybody sit still just a moment. We're really late. Can you give me ten minutes? Yes. Amen. All right. Prayer cards. Let the people who has prayer. Where'd you give them from? One. All right. Prayer card number one. Would you come? Number two. Number three. Number four. Number five. Prayer card number one, two, three, four, five. Stand right over here. Just as quick as you can now. If you can get up, if you can't, well, let us know. We'll come pack you. We're going to try to get as many as we possibly can. One, two, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Amen. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There are only two raised on that. Ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. All of them. All the prayer cards. Move over on this other side. Get on this side over here. On this side, if you will. Oh, isn't he wonderful? Now, everybody just reverend as you can. About ten minutes now. Just about ten minutes. Now, those were prayer cards. We made a declaration that the people want to be prayed for. Come with their prayer cards. And 
so that we won't see they keep coming back. And then they try to use God's gifts as an Ouija board, but we don't, we don't believe in doing that. We, we believe in just letting God do His work. Do you believe that? Amen. How many Amen. believes this message this morning to be the truth? Amen. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. I believe it with all my heart, soul, and mind. Now, looks like we got about 50 people here to be prayed for, something like that. Now, listen. Now, each one of you are in Christ. You're in Christ Jesus. Triumph over all sickness. All you that's in the prayer line are Christians, born-again believers. Raise up your hands. Your position, then, is in Christ. You're already triumphed. The only thing you have to do now is accept and believe what God has said to be the truth. Oh, help us, Lord, right now. I couldn't hardly take that line for a discernment. It would be too much to do. Take us too long. It wouldn't be to me. I believe I could stay here the rest of the day. I just feel good. I just feel good. I know that it's true. Praise the Lord. But now we are in Christ. Yes, amen. Now we are positionally seated in Christ. Amen. Oh, my. Is these things I taught the truth? Amen. If it is, then he'll produce himself. Yes, he will. That's right. How many of you people in the prayer line are strangers? Me, I know a lot of you, but some of you are strangers. Raise up your hand. Those I don't know nothing wrong with you. Raise up your hand. All along the line. Is he Christ? Amen. You believe it? Amen. You must have faith. You must believe it. If you don't believe it, then it won't work. Hallelujah. You've got to know your position. You've got to know your place. Is that right, Brother West? That's right. Know your position. Christ promised the things that I do shall you also. You believe it with all your heart. That man standing back there, something wrong with his hip. You believe it with all your heart. You can't get in the prayer line, but you can go on back and sit down. It's going to leave it. It is in cancer. Hallelujah. Go back and sit down. It's all over. Hallelujah. I've never seen the man in my life. If we are strangers, brother, raise up your hand. If we are strangers, what's the matter? He's healed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Along this altar here, do you believe? What about you? We're strangers. I don't know you. God knows you. You believe me to be His servant? You believe this message I preached? What if I told you your back trouble would leave you? You believe it with all your heart? Well, Mr. Burkhart, you go back to Ohio. You're here. Hallelujah. Praise God. Yes. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. You're not here for yourself. You're here for somebody else. It's a woman. She's from Ohio, too. That's right. Her name's Alice McMahon. That's right. She's had an operation. That's right. Stomach trouble and female trouble and nervousness. Is that right? You just believe and she'll get well. Go on, believe. Believe with all your heart. She'll have it. How do you do? I don't know you. We're strangers. Is that right? You believe me to be his servant? You believe that we're triumphed in Christ? Amen. If you believe with your nervousness and with your troubles and things you have, then Miss Allen, you can return back to your home and be made well. I believe we're strangers, aren't we? I've never seen you before. This is the first time we've ever met. We're strangers one to another. Do you believe me to be his prophet? Hallelujah. You believe it? Amen. Yes. yes, amen. You're suffering with a kidney trouble. That's right, isn't it? You're not from here, you're from down south. You're praying for your unsaved children. That's your husband back behind you. He's got a man on his heart this morning, a friend he's praying for. Say, I see somebody. You are, you are a friend of mine's mother and father. A man that comes up here called a LC or ST or something like that. ST or something. That's, that's your son. JT. ST. No, it's not JT. I know it's a little black-headed man. I see him standing right here before him. Before he's not. Return home. You have your request. Hallelujah. Is that man here this morning? A man from down in Georgia? T.S. Yeah. I never seen your father and mother in my life. You know that's true. But I seen you up here right here before. I'm just saying. I know it was. You have your request, don't doubt. You all believe with all your heart? Amen. Now, how many, each one of you all are in Christ? 
You say, is that the gospel? That's exactly what Jesus Christ did. Amen. That's exactly what the apostles done. That's exactly what Irenaeus and the rest of them done. Amen. That's exactly. You believe it? Amen. Then bow your head. Come here, elder. There's Hallelujah. too many people to go through all that line. All right. We picked out two or three down. Get right down here. This brother Neville of mine is a man of God. I believe it. We're going to pass through this line here and pray for these people, lay hands on them. You all believe you'll get well, each one of you? Everybody in here going to believe it? Then bow your head now. We're in the church triumph. That's the reason I didn't say that to you. I know what he wants. I pray that you'll be in prayer. He's giving his request in the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, with hands laid upon this little prayer this morning, we ask that Jesus' name for his name. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, give to our sister down here a lovely sister who's been a real friend of us here. Uh, and my family and our loved ones, we believe that she and her husband are your children. I pray, God, that you grant her request to her this morning. In Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. God, in Jesus' name, bless our sister. Oh, yeah. We know, Lord, that she is my servant. We pray that you'll give her her request in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Oh, well, Heavenly Father, realize that, that you're alone to heal Sister Brian, but we pray that you'll bless her and grant this request to the Lord in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Heavenly Father, upon our sister, we lay our hands in the name bless of Jesus Christ. Ask for her deliverance for your glory. Amen. Bless. These signs shall follow them that believe. And we lay our hands Amen. upon the sick and shall be Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, grant the Lord, God, nervous, shaking body. Thank you, Lord, are the impact of the Holy Spirit and hired, but your God healed the young woman. God Almighty, give to our brother his request. Hallelujah. Granted, Father, we lay hands upon him and condemn the enemy. They may have a poisonous soul or set up a black mark in front of him. May he rise triumphantly over that this morning, Lord, and realize his position in Christ Jesus. And so shall we have what he has. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Our Heavenly Father, with hands laid upon us, in the name of Jesus Christ, grant it. Amen. Hallelujah. The starting little girl, Father, in the name of Jesus, we will offer you the For the glory of God, we ask for her goodness. Heal in Jesus' name. God, we know the heart cry of this mother, oh, and the cry of her daughter. Jesus. God grant to her faith this morning and the message rising up Hallelujah. now, knowing that she has power over you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. It is so. In God, we know this little boy, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. God, our Father, we lay hands upon our sister and ask this morning you grant her. Amen. In the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Our Heavenly Father, this little lady comes to take her place. Amen. We lay hands upon her and ask for her healing. Jesus Christ. Yes, Father. Right. Jesus Christ. 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 We lay hands upon him that his request will be granted. Amen. In the name of Jesus Christ, may he take his position in honor as the Son of God. Hallelujah. His glory and triumph over all of you. Amen. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, upon our little sister, who's come out of very darkness to walk in the light. Grant far that her gallant little soul will be lifted so high this morning Hallelujah. in the heavenly atmosphere. Grant her request in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Father, upon our brother, we live for the word of Lord Jesus. Our Heavenly Father, we lay hands upon our sister Faith. And ask for her request to be granted to her Father. As we lay our hands upon her in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Our Heavenly Father, we lay hands upon our sister. In the name of Jesus Christ, may her request be granted in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Our Heavenly Father, as our sister passes through this line, oh, and let we lay our hands upon her. May the Christ of God come near her and condemn the trouble and make her well. Hallelujah. Jesus. Heavenly Father, upon our brother, let us hey, look upon him and ask that in the name of Jesus Christ that you will heal him. Heavenly Father, upon 
gospel when I was just a little boy. Bless thy name, Jesus. A few days ago laid dying Hallelujah. with a cancer. Hallelujah. Rushing to get to him. And the power Amen. of God swept down over an 80 year old man and healed him to the doctors was miraculous. I pray Hallelujah. that you would grant his request this morning. His blessed Every little wife, Lord, he washed on the board to send her husband to the ministry to preach Amen. this this leading gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Grant, Lord. Bless her son, Junior, Lord. We pray that you will make him well and keep him strong, Lord. He's their support to haul him from place to place to lay Amen. handkerchiefs. Amen. All those so old, they can't get out into the field no more, Amen. but they go from hospital to home, Amen. placing Amen. handkerchiefs upon Hallelujah. the sick. God, you'll honor that. I know you will. Bless them and give them strength Amen. for many more days, Father. In Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Hallelujah. It shall be done, Brother Kid. It shall be done. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes. When we have grab the phone. I just want to testify just a little bit here. A man and woman of 80 years of age and past can't go out into the fields and stand in the pulpit too old at this time to preach like that. But still, we'll send down here and get packages of prayer cloths and send them to the sick and afflicted and take them to the hospitals and everything like that to lay it up on that. They can't no more get out and support the ministry in that way, but they carry it on the best they can. It ought to make us young people feel ashamed of ourselves. Praise the Lord. Doing something for Christ. Amen. Remember, this old man here, brother kid, was preaching the gospel before I was born. That's right. Out there praying for the sick. A gallant old soldier. And you're old. How old are you, brother kid? 81 years old, still going for the kingdom of God. Too old to stand in the pulpit and hold up a message like that, but will go to the hospital to the bedsides where I've got a boy that drives him around in a car that can't walk, so they just drive him in a car and take him up a place, and that old couple going there and lay a handkerchief on him. They had a loved one, very near dead the other day, a girl, they just tell me about it. We prayed for him, grandchild. Went and laid, uh, child's up now. Praise God. Brother kid, they called me here some time ago, about two years ago, I guess it's been, that he had cancer in the prostrates at about 78 years old or 80 close to 80 years old with cancer in the prostrate the doctors just laid it back and nothing could be done we hurried Billy and I taking turns about driving to get up there where he was at the, the Holy Spirit told us to go that morning we usually don't do it unless we're led to do it and the Holy Spirit said go and we took off there laid hands on the old fellow to pray for him and the doctors can't find a trace of it anywhere Amen. Oh, Amen. oh why our Amen. position Amen. is in Christ Amen. Jesus Ascended far above all diseases and all powers of the enemy. Oh, aren't you happy for him? Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. There are people almost everywhere whose hearts are all on flame. With this fire that fell on Pentecost, that cleansed and made them clean. Oh, it's burning now within my heart. Oh, glory to his name. 
I'm so glad that I can say I'm one of them. I'm one of them. One of them. I'm so glad that I can say one of them. One of them. One of them. I'm so glad that I can say I'm one of them. Though these people may not learn to be or boast of worldly fame, they have all received their Pentecost, baptized in Jesus' name, and they're telling now both far and wide, His power is yet the same. I'm so glad that I can say I'm one of them. How many is one of them? Raise your hands up. Them, one of them. I'm so glad that I can say one of them. Oh, one of them. One of them. I'm so glad that I can say one of them. Now come, my brothers, seek this blessing that will cleanse your heart from sin. That will start the joy bells ringing and will keep your soul on flame. Oh, it's burning now within my heart. Glory to His name. I'm so glad that I can say I'm one of them. I'm one of them. One of them. I'm so glad I can say I'm one of them. Hallelujah. One of them. One of them. I'm so glad that I can say I'm one of them. They were gathered in an upper room, all praying. They were baptized with the Holy Ghost. Then power for service came. Now what He did for them that day, He'll do for you the same. And I'm so glad that I can say I'm one of them. I'm one of them. I'm one of them. I'm so glad that I can say I'm one of them. Hallelujah. One of them. I'm one of them. Oh, I'm so glad that I can say I'm one of them. Now, while we hum it, let's just shake hands with one of them. One of them. One of them. I'm so glad of them. Hallelujah. I'm one of them. I'm so glad that I can say I'm one of them. Aren't you? Say amen. I'm one of them. I'm one of them. I'm so glad that I can say I'm I'm so glad that I can say I'm one of them. Can I sing just one verse over? Amen. Though these people may not learn to be, they don't have any great big DD PhDs, you see, you know, great big things. These people may not learn to be, nor boast of worldly fame, some great organization. They have all received their Pentecost, every one of them baptized in Jesus' name. And they're telling now both far and wide, His power is yet the same. I'm so glad that I can say I'm one of them, one of them, one of them. I'm so glad that I can say I'm one of them, I'm one of them. I'm so glad that I can say I'm one of them. Oh, not for all earth's golden millions would I leave this precious place. Though per- tempter has persuaded me, off have tried. But I'm safe in God's pavilion, happy in His love and grace. And I'm living on the hallelujah side. Hallelujah. Oh, Praise our God. I'm so glad of that, aren't you? Aren't you glad to be one of them? Amen. That's one of them. One of them humble people that just emptied yourself out. Come down, not before an idol, but before a living God. 
Not before an organization put your name on the book before a living God. Not to recite a creed, but to let the Word become flesh in you. <laughs> That's it. And humble yourself. And then through that, He exalted you up above, not to be heady, high-minded, say, I'm this, that, or the other, but in humility, sweetness. Now, how did He ever save a wretch like me? How did He ever do it? That's the way the real Christian feels. Don't you believe that? Oh, He is so real. Real, real. He's so real to me. Oh, real, real. He's so real to me. Though some people doubt Him, I can't live without Him. That's why I love Him, and He's so real to me. Real, He's so real to me. Sing it. Real, real, He's so real to me. Though some people doubt Him, but I can't live without Him. That is why I love Him, and He's so real to me. Oh, I'm so glad of that. Yes, sir. Oh, I'm so glad for this great old gospel way. Living in this glorious old gospel way. Now, friends, till we meet at the throne of Christ again, when you're praying, remember me. God bless every one of you. I can't say that I'm sorry I kept you here. Now, if you just got the handkerchief laid here, I've just laid hands up on them while we were praying for the sick. If you notice me doing it, as soon as the Spirit struck... I didn't go in too many visions because I'm weak, tired, you know. I've been here about two or three hours now preaching. And I just thought it would get a few along the line so that you'll see that God is God. Amen. The impossible, the paradox, <laughs> that the things unsearchable, the devil. Now, remember, each one of you has power in Christ. You don't have power, you have authority. Amen. Your authority. You're just exalted way above. Not to be exalt yourself up, but Christ has lifted you up. More Christ lifts you up, the farther you want to be down. See, you feel so humble. So how would he ever save a wretch like me? How did he ever do it? But he did it. And so I'm thankful for it. Amen. Uh, so good. At the name of Jesus, Jesus bow me. Falling, prostrate at His feet. King of kings in heaven will crown Him. Oh, when our journey is complete. Precious name, precious name. Oh, how sweet. Oh, hover and jaw. Precious name, isn't he wonderful? Oh, sweet, how sweet. oh Father, and joy of heaven. Now listen, don't forget this. You sing the chorus, let me sing the verse to it. Sing. If I know if I can think of the verse, I want to sing of it. The next thing. At the name of Jesus bowing, falling prostrate at his feet. King and kings of heaven will crown him when our journey is complete. See, take the name of Jesus with you as a shield from ever snare. When temptations around you gather, just breathe that holy name in prayer. That's all. Raise up that hand and listen to the brakes line. <laughs> breathe that holy name in prayer. Precious name, oh, how sweet, oh, power and joy of hell. Precious name, oh, precious name, oh, how sweet, oh, power and joy. Let's say that again, all of us together. What do you say? Let's just take that verse again about take the name of Jesus with you as a shield from every snare. Let's sing it out with our eyes closed. Take the name of Jesus with you as a shield from every snare. Now listen, what do? 
Oh, and temptations round together. What must you do? Breathe that holy name. Neville, you're a pastor now. 